All right, let's begin with a quick review of set theory. First off, what is probability good for? Well, one thing it's good for is you may be disappointed or dejected to learn that half of you in this classroom, well, except that you're not actually in the classroom, but half of you in this class will actually eventually die of heart disease. Well, that's that's kind of depressing to hear. So. Wouldn't you want to know something? We, we do know that people who, have, who do die of heart disease, they often seem to have high cholesterol. But wouldn't you like to know if you yourself happen to have high cholesterol, what does that tell you about the risk of you dying of heart disease? Turns out that if you know some statistics, that is, for example, the number of people who die of heart disease who do seem to have high cholesterol. And you also know the number of people with high cholesterol and the number of people who die of heart disease. You can actually back out of that information the probability that you will die of heart disease if you do have high cholesterol. I went over that with a whiz, but that's going to be Bayes' theory at the end of this chapter 2 or this major section on probability, and that's actually very exciting and lots of fun to work on. So we're going to work our way towards that. So first off, let's talk about some definitions, and this is quick and easy stuff. So we'll just review it very quickly, and we can say a set is a collection of objects called elements. And examples of sets would be, well, let's see, we could have ostrich and a gorilla and a boat, something like that. Or we could have integers 1, 2, and 3. More than that, we can also note that a set can contain finite or an infinite number of elements. So that's all kind of common sense, and you've seen all of this before. But there are some special sets, the null set, and we usually denote that with this zero with a cross through it. Oh, that was sort of poorly done, maybe more like this. And it contains no elements at all, not even a zero. And then, on the other hand, the sample set, we usually denote that with an S, and that contains all possible outcomes from the process under consideration. So often that's called the sample space. And an example of that would be the sample space of outcomes for flipping a coin. And so we could write that it, S is equal to what are the outcomes? We, we could have heads, we could have tails. Well, we could have on the edge, or we could have that it falls down drain. I mean, there's, there's sort of a lot of different things that could happen to it. But usually, only realistic outcomes are provided. So what we do is we go bunk, 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 and we cross those kinds of things out, and we just include the sample spaces being heads and tails. So we've got a few more definitions and properties, and we can say that the, well, for one thing, the complement of set A, and that's AC, C for complement. Sometimes we put this little prime symbol, which your book often uses, and that's the set of all elements that are not in A. So we could say if A was something like 1, 2, and 3, then we could say A naught would be all of the numbers that were not 1, 2, and 3. And let's say we're just talking about positive integers, then we could say it would be 4, 5, 6, and so forth. So then we can note that the union, A union B, is equal to A complement intersects B complement. So this one you can savor a little bit, because we're going to next talk about this union and intersection. But do keep this in mind, that this the union, once you complement it, can be written in this other way. But I've gotten ahead of myself, so let's go on and talk about what I mean by union and intersection. 
first off, if all elements of a set are also element of a set A, are also elements of a set B, then A is a, what can we say, subset of B, and it's denoted by, in this fashion, we say A is a subset of B. And then we can say that if we have the union of two sets A and B is the set of that contains all elements of A or B A or B and let's look up here A or B means something that includes everything that's in A or B. So it's this whole gigantic mess right here. I like to think of it this way. When you see this union sign, well, it's A or B. Well, look, it's like a little bow. And we put our little or there and we're off we go. We're rowing away and that's how we remember it's A or B. And so the intersection of two sets A and B is a set containing all common elements of A and B. And it's denoted by this sort of symbol, A and B. Look at this. A and B is actually the smaller of the two, right? Or B is this big thing. And A, A and B is this smaller sort of set. So it's or, and, union, intersection. Those are commonly used ideas. So here what we have is A union B. So A union B is going to be this massive thing with A. Well, let's see. We'll put it all in here. A and B. Then we are taking that and intersecting it with C. So what intersects? Only this small portion of everything. And then likewise over here we have A intersect C not. So A intersecting C is all of this stuff right here. But then they're saying it's not that. So it's actually all of this shaded in area right here. So let's uh, let's move on a little bit. We'll talk about some common set properties. We have the commutative law, which is just, well, look at this. A union B is the same as B union A. And, well, that makes sense. I mean, if, if it's all of these things, then it doesn't really matter which way you have them. And likewise, for intersection, it's only this part. So if you swap around A intersect B or B intersect A, it's the same sort of thing. And the associative law, well, we can move things around a little bit. These are all pretty much what you would expect. It's just nice to review them. A union itself is just A. Well, and A intersecting with itself is A also. And of course, unioning A with the null set is just leaving A, whereas intersecting A with the null set leaves you with the null set. So now let's have an application of probabilistic methods in time sequences. So what we can do is we can look at the time perception of one minute. So if you look at it, having fun is, well, that's less than a minute. Doing nothing is more than a minute. Torture is like four minutes. And waiting for the computer to load is like nine minutes. And probably sometimes when you're listening to online classes, it's like that. But we will try to make it occasionally a little bit enjoyable for you so that you don't have this time sequence problem. Okay, so let's solve the following problem together. The set of integers between 1 and 50 that's divisible by 8. So if we look at that, 
we should end up with something that looks like that. We have a sample set that's, well, if it's divisible by 8, it should be 8, well, 16, 24, 32, 40, and 48. Voila! Yay! Okay, now we'll look at the set that's S where we have X such that X squared plus 4X minus 5 is equal to 0. Well, let's see. This rascal is 0 when you have X plus 5 or X minus 1 is equal to 0. So that means that the only solutions are going to be S is equal to minus 5 or 1. So now we have the set, so that's for B, that's the solution. Now we need the set of outcomes when a coin is tossed until a, head, a tail or three heads appear. So let's see what can happen. If we toss a head, if we, or uh, toss a coin, we could have two outcomes. We could have heads or we can have tails. Now we know that if we have tails, well, we've had a, a tail appear so we can't do anything more. But what if we have heads? Well, we can do again. We could toss it again and then we could get a head or a tail. Well, if we get a tail, eh, well, we're done. But if we get another head, we can keep going. In fact, we can go till it goes head again. Oops, sorry about that. But I'm writing away on that. And so then you can see what we've got is we've got either a tail, a head and then a tail, a head and a head and then a tail, or a head, head, and head. So let's write that down. So we'll say that the sample set consists of tails, head and then a tail, and then head, head, tail, and lastly, we've got, let's see, three heads. So head, head, head. So notice that you can have different lengths of outcomes. And sometimes that seems a little counterintuitive to people. Finally, we have the set where we have uh, x such that 2x minus 4 is greater than or equal to 0 and x is less than 1. So what is that? If we solve this equation, you can see you can just rearrange it and say that x is greater than or equal to 2. But, oh wait a minute, x is greater than or equal to 2 is this one. x is less than 1 is equal to this, is this constraint. Oh, well, clearly we're going to have to have that s is equal to the empty set. So that's that problem. Now let's move on to the next problem. This one has an experiment that involves tossing a pair of dice. We've got one green, one red. We record the numbers that come up. If x equals the outcome on the green die and y equals the outcome on the red die, describe the sample space S by listing those elements. Well, okay, we know we could have S is equal to, let's see, 1 and 1, and, or, well, we'll call that 1 and 1, and we could have 1 and 2, and we could have, oh heck, yeah, I just, ah, okay, I love this. So we could have a set that looks like this. It's very straightforward, and but it sure is nice to see exactly what these kinds of sets can look at look like. And this is the the sample set for this particular experiment. So let's go to the next one. The next one involves considering a sample space that's got these different types of uh, chemicals in them, and we have A is given, that set is given by copper, sodium, and zinc, B by sodium, nitrogen, and potassium, and C is oxygen only. So we're supposed to list these different sets. Well, A naught, 
what we do is we go over here and we say, well, what is A? A is copper, sodium, and zinc. So copper, copper, sodium, and zinc. So A naught's got to be whatever is left, which is going to be nitrogen, potassium, and uranium, and oxygen. So A union C is going to be, well, let's see, we've got our little boat there, right, with our little ore. So it's A or C, and remember that's bigger. So we're going to have A or C. That means we kind of join them together. We're going to have copper, sodium, zinc, and oxygen. Ah, I'll just write it out. Okay. So we've got all four of those. Now we've got a little bit of a fancier one. We've got A intersect B naught and unioning, unioning that with C naught. Hmm, okay. Well, we know what A is. Let's see if we can figure it out B naught. B naught, so sodium, that's not going to be there. Nitrogen, that's out too, and so is potassium. So what we've got left for B naught is going to be copper and potassium. Oops, oops, oh no, that's not there. That's crossed out, so we'll cross it out. Um, uranium and oxygen and zinc. So let's see, we've got copper, uranium, oxygen, and zinc. So that's B naught. Now we want to have A intersecting B naught. Well, let's see. A, we know what A is. It's copper, sodium, and zinc. And here's these rascals here for B naught. The only common ones between the two are copper and zinc. So we'll make, whoops, let's just say that set is equal to copper and zinc. Now we're supposed to union that with C naught. Well those rascals, look at this. C has only oxygen. So C naught is going to be everything in here except for oxygen. So we're going to have to say C naught is going to be copper, sodium, nitrogen, potassium, let's see, and uranium, and zinc. So that's C naught, and so then ultimately we'll have that A intersect B naught union with C naught is going to be, well you got to get this thing all together and add in these two. So we're going to have copper and sodium and nitrogen and potassium and uranium and zinc. And add those all in together and that gives you your result. So you've gone over this whole thing and now it should be sort of clear um, how to do these kinds of things. It's very, it's very common sense. Okay, so now let's move on to something just a little bit different. I'd like to talk about permutation and combination. So what you can say is that if order does matter, it is a permutation. So you can say 3, 2, 1 is different than 1, 2, 3, right? So order does matter for that kind of permutation. But if order does not matter, it is a combination. And for, for combinations, we can have, well, 3, 2, 1 is the same as 1, 2, 3, right? Because well, they've still got the same numbers on them. So what that really means is that we should call a combination lock 
instead of a combination lock, we should call it a permutation lock because order does matter. And a permutation, you can say, is an ordered combination. To help you remember this, just think that permutation is associated with position. Now, another way to remember this is that permutation, this is actually one of my previous classes. There's some of my students. Okay, so permutation sounds complicated, and it actually is complicated. Every little detail matters. If we have Frank, comma, Bob, and Charlie, we rearrange the order of these three people, it would be different than Charlie, Bob, and Frank. But combinations are pretty easy going. It doesn't matter how these three people are arranged. You can have Frank, Bob, and Charlie, and there's the same as Bob, Charlie, and Frank, and that's just the way it is. So there's two types, as it turns out, of permutations. The first is one where repetition is allowed. And this one could be something like, you know, well, we can allow three and three and three. You were picking out that you had three positions and you could have ten digits possible in any one position. So you could have ten here, ten here, and ten here. So in other words, for the first position you could pick a one or a two or a zero or a nine. Same for this one, same for this one. So you might ask, how many total possibility of permutations are there where repetition is allowed? Well, you can have 10 possible possibilities for the first position. So that's 10. You can have 10 possibilities for the second position. So for those first two positions, you've got 100 possibilities. Now, you take the third position, well, that adds another 10. So you've got, well, it doesn't add, it multiplies another 10. So you've got a thousand possibilities for these three positions if you have 10 different numbers available for each one. Now let's try to write that out as something that's a little bit more, more organized. We can say that we can have, for this one, however many numbers available, that we'll call that n. If there's n numbers available, well, you can have n for the first position, n for the second position, n for the third position. And in fact, however many of these things you have, let's say that you had r of them, you could say that you could multiply these things r times and, well, you're going to have n to the r possibilities. So, however many positions you have, and however many numbers you have, ultimately you have n to the r possible permutations where repetition is allowed. Now the second type of permutation is that where there's no repetition. For example, the first three people in a running race. It can't be the first person and the second person. Likewise, let's say that you had 52 cards in a deck and you're going to choose three cards. Okay, so you're gonna, you might ask yourself, okay, how many possibilities are there for me to choose the first card? Well, there's 52 cards, so there's 52 possibilities. What about the second one? We've already chosen one of the cards, so that means there's only 51 cards possible for the second choice. Likewise, for the third choice, we've got 50 cards avail available. So, the number of, of permutations possible is actually 52 times 51 times 50. Now, let's see, doesn't this actually look a little bit like a factorial? You know what a factorial is, it's 52, well, let's see, 52 factorial is going to be 52 times 51 times 50 times da, da 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 right? So we're going to keep going. But wait a minute, we've only got these first three. So we've chosen only three. R is equal to three. That's how many, this is where our choice is. 
So we're choosing 3. Hmm. Now how could we write this in some kind of way where we can quantify this? We, we, we want to say if we choose 3 of however many cards are available, this number right here, let's try that, is the same as 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48, okay, so I'm, I'm going along, divided by 49 times 48 times, and I'm going along, see, and this all cancels. It's the same, right, as this. So, we're getting close now. If we write this as 52 factorial, right, that's this top number, over 52 minus r, which this time it was minus 3, right, factorial. Because look at that, that's, that's where it starts at 49, right? That's 49 factorial. That actually gives us the same outcome as just 52 times 51 times 50. So what I'm trying to lead you to here is the idea that the second time of type of permutation with no repetition can be written as, this is PNR, or sometimes we write it N, and this means permutation of N objects chosen R at a time. And we can say N P R is equal to N factorial over N minus R factorial. This is a number, or this is an equation that we will see time after time. So if you can put in your mind this simple idea that N factorial, and then this bottom half just takes away all of the stuff that we don't need. It erases it away, carves it away, so that we only have the permutation of, of the numbers with no repetition. So this is no repetition, and then uh, we have, remember that if there is with repetition, repetition, sorry, then we just have that it's n to the r. So there's, it's a little bit different as far as the probabilities go, right, or how you write these kinds of things, but each one of them makes sense. Now, let's say we're reducing a permutation to a combination. If you take a look here, let's say that I wanted to know what three pool balls were chosen from 16 different ones, not the order. In other words, I just want to know what are, is the prob or the possible um, set of combinations of three pool balls that are chosen from 16 different pool balls. We, we already know that 3 out of 16 would give us 3,360 permutations. In other words, for the first pool ball, we would have 16 possibilities. For the second that we would choose, we'd have 15. For the third, we'd have 14. All of this totals to 3,360. So, the, the ultimate is that if we're just looking at combinations, not permutations, we don't care about the order. So, for example, let us say that balls 1, 2, and 3 are chosen. We can have some possibilities. If order does not matter, we can have 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3. We can have six different ways of rearranging those three balls. But if order doesn't matter, we just have 1, 2, 3, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. That's the same as 3, 2, 1 or any other choice. 
permutations then, there's six different possibilities. Combination, there's only one. So, if that's the case then, permutations, we can see permutations have six times as many possibilities. Abilities. So w what is that? That's actually, well, let's see. For the first slot, we have three different possibilities, right? So that's three. Second slot, we have two different possibilities, two. Third slot, we only have one left, and that's the six. Look at that. That's six. Well, let's see. That's the same as three factorial. We've chosen three. This is like R, isn't it? R factorial. Hmm. What this means then is that we can actually, we can say that a permutation can become a combination and the way to do it is to reduce our permutation formula by the how many ways the object could be could be put into order because we aren't interested in the order anymore so maybe the best way to show you that is to just actually write this down we know the number of permutations is n factorial divided by n minus r factorial that is, this is where repetition is not allowed. Now, if we multiply this number of permutations by, or divide it by r factorial, that's how we reduce the number of permutations to the number of combinations, right? Because remember, we could divide it by six because six of them were all the same. So we can then say that a combination is just n factorial over n minus r factorial divided by r factorial, and that's it. So we can say combinations can be written as n choose r, or we can write it. There's lots of different ways of doing this. And sometimes you'll see this n over r, and that means, make sure you memorize that, n factorial over r factorial, n minus r factorial, right? So all of these different ways can be written to write a combination where n is equal to the number of things you choose from and you choose r of them and this is where again no repetition and order doesn't matter and there you go that is the ultimate result so then here I put sort of a little uh, compendium here of all of the important results that we've just covered in this area and that relates to the number of permutations of n objects where repetition is allowed. This is the number of permutations where repetition is not allowed. Here you go. This is actually the number of permutations of n objects where let's say you had hmm, 10 uh, pieces of fruit and three of them were mangoes, two of them were oranges and five of them were bananas. Well, you could say the number of permutations of those different pieces of fruit could be written in this fashion. So this is just a preview of something we'll see in more detail later on. Lastly, here's combinations and here's how we would write the com number of combinations of subsets of size r selected from n objects. And that is all we have for this section.